United States government telex sent in January 1976, ordering equipment to defend the American embassy in Moscow against Soviet attack. Since the 1950s, the Soviets had been irradiating the embassy with a mysterious microwave signal. Although the American government knew about the signal, they kept it a secret from the world and from their own embassy staff. When they finally got round to installing protective screens, they did so in a hurry. At the height of the Moscow winter, with the temperature 30 degrees below zero, the list of equipment they requisitioned included Arctic clothing for the workers who were going to install the screens. Vice President Richard Nixon visits Moscow, where he gets involved in the famous kitchen debates with Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev about the relative virtues of communism and capitalism. The Khrushchev is telling Mr. Nixon that Russia will catch up to America and wave as she passes us by. So he says in words and actions. While the Americans were busy showing off the best products capitalism had to offer, the Soviets were quietly using some technology of their own. When Nixon's secret service men checked out his room at the electronic bugs, they found a mysterious microwave signal coming from across the street, beamed straight at the embassy building and its personnel. To find out what the Soviets were trying to achieve, the Americans set up a top-secret multi-million dollar program, which they called Project Pandora. They appointed many of their top scientific experts in microwave radio, though not all of them are happy with the way the investigation was conducted. It's never really uh, been uh, fully explained to the people who were there and were irradiated, let alone to the rest of us. Uh, for example, um, there were some secret studies done on the people who were being irradiated. They weren't told they were being irradiated. And uh, there wasn't any reason for them not to have been told. Uh, the only thing that made this secret is that it was a Soviet clandestine operation. Clandestine operation. To carry out these secret studies, members of the Pandora team deceived the staff and told them they were taking blood samples as part of a viral study to find out the cause of a stomach complaint which was common amongst the embassy personnel. Back home, other Pandora scientists were performing laboratory experiments with animals. Their results were disturbing. Monkeys exposed to microwave radiation showed a marked decline in their ability to perform simple tasks. Rather than go public with these results and demand that the Soviets switch off the radiation, the American government remained silent. The man who ran Pandora, Dr. Sam Kozlov. Why the thing was still retained at the level of security it was, by 19, see, I went to Moscow in 1976 to try to negotiate with the Russians on getting that radiation turned off. Why it was still, that was the time, you know, that broke open. Why that was still classified at that time is utterly incomprehensible to me. That's all I can tell you. I, I can't tell you why, I don't know. I think it's simply a typical governmental ph a phenomena. It fell into the crack. <laughs> The crack Pandora fell into was so deep that five presidents, their intelligence services, and their closest advisors managed to keep it a secret. But throughout the 60s and the 70s, it was on the agenda at the various summit meetings between East and West. Characteristically, President Lyndon Johnson thought he personally could solve the problem when he met Soviet Premier Andrei Kosygin face to face in 1967. Away from the corridors of power, it seemed both could talk like that. Friends of mine in the intelligence community told me after the meeting that members from the American Party formed the others that this radiation was going on. And my understanding was that Premier Kosekin was embarrassed by that and didn't know anything about it and said that when he got home, if he found out it was so, he was going to stop it. 
and I was told that he, after he got home, uh, he did stop it, so I didn't have to worry about this anymore. But Kosygin failed to stop it, and the radiation continued. The Americans monitored it on a day-to-day -day basis, though still keeping it a secret from the next generation of embassy staff. As a member of the American intelligence community noted, this was an interesting example of detente, the Soviets providing the radiation and the Americans providing the guinea pigs. Then in 1975, the signal suddenly changed. The Soviets began to irradiate the embassy from two new transmitters. After an anxious exchange of telexes between Washington and Moscow, the American government eventually took a more positive initiative. They decided to put up the aluminium screens to protect the embassy, even though this meant that they would have to finally share their embarrassing secret with the embassy staff. Surely that would increase alarm rather than decrease it. I mean, if I was in the building and somebody put some aluminium shielding up over windows, I would then firmly believe that something had been coming in that might have damaged me. You're now dealing with the sociology and not the science of the situation. There's two, uh, sides, of the there's there's two the sides of the coin. One is you want to make your point to the Soviets, and therefore you say, well, I've got to cut it down. You also want to make your point to the people, look, whatever there was, we don't think it was harming you, but it's now a factor of 10 less. And I would agree with you, if you feel that the thing has been mishandled in the first place, you're going to worry more about it. I, you know, I don't know what you can do about that. The, the simple fact was there wasn't a hazardous level before the screen was put in, and there was one-tenth less than a non-hazardous level when the screen was put in. The embassy staff were unimpressed by this line of reasoning, and a number of them complained to the press. After the subsequent publicity, Henry Kissinger, whose department had consistently lied to the embassy personnel, delivered a short, if ironic, homily on the virtues of trust and confidence amongst government employees. somebody was involved in this for a considerable period, then why do you think the Soviets did it? Uh, I prefer not answering that question, okay? None of us will ever know, because Soviets aren't going to dis discuss this in public, and uh, neither will the people in my government discuss this in public. I have my own personal ideas as to what they were doing, which I would rather not discuss, okay? Can you say why you'd rather not discuss it? Uh, I think I'll get into security areas. It's been uh, disturbing to see that it still continues. Uh, even though I had been told that the Soviets had stopped it. Uh, Officially, it has stopped, hasn't it? Officially, it never started. I think according to the Soviets, they've never been doing this. More than two and a half thousand Pandora papers, including telexes, telegrams, secret reports, and internal memos, have now been released by the American government under the Freedom of Information Act. They make interesting and enlightening reading, except for the fact that they've all been carefully edited to exclude any reference to the most important question of all. Why did the Soviets do it? Certainly, after the signal changed in 1975, it could have been used for surveillance. It was in that year that the Soviets started irradiating the embassy with two separate microwave beams at right angles, whose paths met actually in the ambassador's office and very close to his secretary's golf ball typewriter. Alarmed by the thought that everything typed on this machine might be going straight to the KGB, the Americans spent several frantic months investigating this possibility before concluding that it was technically feasible for the Soviets to monitor every single letter and number as it was used by analyzing the beam after it had been reflected off the golf ball. The Americans then checked to see exactly what had been typed on the ambassador's machine, only to find that it had never been used for anything of any intelligence value. So after all that panic and effort, they were not really any closer to knowing whether or not the signal was being used for surveillance, or if its true purpose was to affect the health, either mental or physical, of the embassy staff. Dr. Robert Becker, another of the eminent scientists consulted by the American government about the embassy radiation. I believe that uh, uh, there's very little question that uh, you do produce central nervous system disturbances by uh, uh, microwave exposure. Uh, I don't believe that you could, at the present level of technology, put someone to sleep instantaneously like that. But uh, one could interfere with uh, decision-making capacity. Uh, one could uh, produce a situation of chronic stress, 
something which uh, your embassy personnel just do not operate quite